Uh, midterm is on Thursday, so today we're going to give a wrap up. Midterm is on Thursday. So today we're going to give a wrap up of the course so far and then ask, answer questions or whatever on it. Of you have uh, gotten. Uh, okay, we, uh, we've done the first two parts of the course um, on demand and supply and price and applications uh, of, uh, and, and case studies of intervention, government intervention into the price system. Okay. Uh, we started with the law of diminishing margin utility. In other words, that uh, given uh, the greater the, this is this is utility on the y-axis and this is quantity. The greater the supply of a good, the lower the utility of each unit. That's the law of the measuring margin utility. <clears throat> so that if you uh, this solves the value paradox. In other words, the idea how come that uh, how come that water, even though it's extremely important for life, or bread, which is important for life, is very cheap? On the other hand, diamonds, which are a mere luxury and frippery, are very expensive. That's the famous value paradox. <laughs> Solved by concentrating on the unit. In other words, that the people do not, do not evaluate the entire supply of bread or water or diamonds for all time or even for the current time. They evaluate each unit, each loaf of bread, each carrot of diamonds, each glass of water or gallon or whatever. Uh, and this solves the value paradox because there's a lot more bread and water around than there are diamonds. And so the relative scarcity of uh, diamonds is greater. <coughs> Unit. In other words, the lower the margin utility. Margin, margin concentrates or focuses on each unit, and utility means value or, or you know, placed on a unit. So, so this. This means, as I say, the, 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 the greater the supply of a good, the, the lower the value of each unit. Uh, we don't know the exact the slope of this. As a matter of fact, you can't even talk about the slope since it's, uh, this value is an ordinal concept. Utility is an ordinal concept. <clears throat> but we do know that it's, it's lower as you get more units of, of a good. Okay, taking that and also taking the fact that every individual in the market has different value scales and different, uh, uh, different valuations that he places, he or she places on different commodities, you wind up with a falling demand curve. In other words, that the price of any good or service on the y-axis, quantity on the x-axis, at any given price, at a higher price, people will buy less of it, at a lower price, they'll buy more of it. You get something like that. Uh, we don't know that it's linear, the demand curve. We just know that it's falling. <clears throat> In that sense, it's a little bit like the utility, uh, utility curve there. Uh, we just for convenience we make it a straight line, but it, it, all we know is it's, it's, it's going to be people will buy more of it at a lower price and less of it at a higher price. That's the key. And by knowing that, you already know more than most of the people in the United States, because most people think of the demand curve as if they think of it at all as vertical, and regardless of what the price is, people will buy the same amount. <clears throat> you know, they in their daily lives, of course, don't act that way. <coughs> um, so. We have a falling demand curve, and the, and the major property of the demand curve is, is elasticity. Okay. Um, this is a um, this is an analogy from physics or physical sciences, where a spring is more elastic. If you place a certain amount of weight on a spring, it's more elastic the more distance it moves by putting a weight on it. Less elastic, less distance it moves. Similarly, that elasticity is how much if you if a, if a price falls, the price of any good falls, how much will Quantity increase, but only increases a little bit. The demand curve is considered inelastic. If it increases a lot, it's considered elastic. So, in a sense, the flatter, given given the uh, given point, like here, the flatter the curve, the more elastic it is, and the, and the steeper, the less elastic. <clears throat> the demand curve cannot be horizontal uh, because it's falling uh, it's, it's at any given price, and it can't be vertical for the same reason. <clears throat> But somewhere, any demand curve will, will be within this structure. Uh, you can define it. You can define elasticity in, in, you know, in various ways. The textbook definition is all right for its own purposes, where the, we, the percentage elasticity is the percentage change in quantity divided by the percentage change in price. That's one way to do it. The trouble with that is 
There's nothing wrong with it mathematically. Just the trouble is it's irrelevant economically. Nobody really measures this thing because nobody knows what it is anyway. And from the, from, the, from the economic point of view, from the point of view of the businessman, the firm, or the industry, what's really important is the direction. What's, what happens to total revenue? That's what it's really concerned with. If you cut price, will total revenue go up or go down? It could work either way. The total revenue is equal to price times quantity. And since as the price falls, these, these two things are going in opposite directions. Right? In other words, as the price goes down, quantity goes up. And what the <coughs> impact on total revenue is purely is part of, depends on the problem. Depends on the good and the people buying it and all, and all that sort of stuff. Nobody knows in advance what it is. We can have hunches. But uh, nobody knows with any precision what the elasticity of the man curve is at any time. So, so the way I define elasticity is the man curve is elastic if when price change, when price falls, total revenue goes up. So the total, this total revenue, this area here, which is of course price times quantity, is greater than this. <clears throat> so the uh, demand curve is elastic if uh, when price falls, if price falls, total revenue increases. And uh, the demand, curve, the demand curve is inelastic if, when price falls, total revenue drops. Okay. So this would be elastic, and this would be inelastic. And uh, okay, it's inelastic <coughs> if, when price falls, uh, total revenue decreases. If the total revenue remains the same, in other words, if it's some online here, then it's called unitarily elastic, a unit elasticity. So this is unit or elasticity equal to one. Uh, if price falls, total revenue remains the same. <clears throat> so in other words, we have a schedule here with um, so this is price and this is quantity, and this uh, price is ten dollars a whatever it is, the item or the case or whatever, and quantity sold was 100, total revenue is 1,000. The price goes down to 9, and quantity goes up to 120, this is 1,080, and so that means the demand curve is elastic in that zone, in this, in this region. If, on the other hand, it only goes up to 105, then it's... Uh, 945, right? In that case, total revenue is inelastic. If it just the percentage change is exactly the same, then it winds up with a thousand, and then, then it's the total revenue is unit, unitarily elastic or unit elasticity, neither elastic nor inelastic. Um, we saw that <coughs> the demand curves, as they were drawn by economic textbooks, in economic textbooks before 1943, approximately, were all like this: they were rectangular hyperbole, which means that the total revenue was always constant. Never changed. And uh, the way this got out of the textbook, it takes a lot to get something out of a textbook. Once it's enshrined in the textbook, it takes almost dynamite to get it out. And uh, with Professor Stiegler, a later Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize winner in economics, said, well, why, is, why, why do they say this? There's no evidence for this nonsense. There's no evidence that the total revenue remains the same. Matter of fact, it probably changes. Why don't we make it a straight line? Ever since then, the man curves have been straight lines. There's no evidence for that either, but at least it doesn't assume constant total revenue. So at least you can see that there are changes as you go up and down. <clears throat> so this is the most important property of the demand curve, it's elasticity. <clears throat> and that depends whether the total revenue goes up or down when the price uh, changes. Of course, the exact opposite occurs when you go up when the price increases. In other words, in economics and microeconomics, you can always change the signs so it's symmetrical. So this is, as the price goes up, elasticity, unit, elasticity if the price goes, increases, total revenue drop, falls. Exact opposite happens. You go up the, the uh, in other words, you go up from here. Uh, price goes up from here to here. If the total revenue drops, it's an elastic curve. If the total revenue goes up, it's an inelastic curve. So the, again, you just reverse this. So if, total, if, if price increases, and total revenue I increases, then it's an inelastic demand curve. And similarly, of course, if the price increases and total revenue remains the same, you still have your unit elastic range. On any given demand curve, uh, the elasticity changes in the course of the curve. Just because it's flat or steep doesn't necessarily mean it's elastic or inelastic. If you go down here, it might change. If you go up here, particularly, 
you might have a steep looking curve, but eventually, if you keep raising the price, it will become elastic. <clears throat> In other words, it will become, total revenue will start falling. So you increase the price of Wonder Bread of $20 a loaf, whatever, the total revenue suckers will spend on it will fall considerably. So you can't just look, the only time you can look at the flatness or steepness and say that's, that's elastic or inelastic is when you have the same point. You're referring to the same point. <clears throat> um, okay, so that's the, <clears throat> that's the elasticity of demand, uh, property of that. And then we, then we went to, uh, then we brought in the supply line. We now have elasticity of demand. Oh, one thing about elasticity of demand, again, is that you know, we don't know what the elasticity is. We do know the more range of choice, other things being equal, the greater the range of choice in uh, what the consumer or the buyer has, the more elastic the demand curve will tend to be. So in other words, if the, <clears throat> the price of Wonder Bread goes up <clears throat> from a dollar a loaf to dollar fifty, <clears throat> and all the other bread prices remain the same, there's going to be a tremendous falling off in purchase. On the other hand, if all the bread prices go up, there'll be a falling off and not nearly as great because there won't be that range of choice. Consumers wouldn't be able to shift from Wonder Bread to, to, to Tasty Bread or Pepperidge Farm. They're all going up. They have to shift the rolls or you know whatever. So <clears throat> similarly here, if the if Wonder Bread is the only firm that cuts its price, you have a big increase in quantity purchased. If all the breads <clears throat> cut their prices, you'd have a small increase, not nearly as much. So the other thing we can say is that the demand curve for the firm, the individual firm is always greater than the demand curve for the industry. It could be a little bit greater, it could be a lot greater, we don't know. But we do know it will be more elastic, demand curve for the firm, unless, of course, the industry has only one firm in it. It becomes the same thing. So, uh, <clears throat> all right, then we, then we uh, move from that to the determination of price. <clears throat> Most important single item, single part of a course. How are prices in the market determined? When two things, in the market, of course, you have exchange of two commodities and two people. <clears throat> and uh, every every exchange is that sort of exchange. I buy a sandwich for whatever it is, a buck and a half or something. I'm exchanging a buck and a half for a sandwich. So uh, this is price again on the y-axis, quantity on the x-axis. You have a demand curve for any given product, a fully demand curve, and you have a at any given time you have a vertical supply line. In other words, you have a certain number of goods which are out there on the market ready to be sold today. Uh, heads of lettuce, uh, stereo sets. Uh, Gears, gears, whatever happens to be, or nails. There's a certain amount ready to be sold and a certain demand curve. And then what <clears throat> we maintain is that the day-to-day -day price on the market will be the intersection point between the demand curve and the supply line. <clears throat> and uh, this will be the equilibrium price any any good or service. If the good or service differs from that, differs from the equilibrium, there are forces in the market which immediately bring it back to that particular intersection point. That's why it's called equilibrium, because equilibrium physics is if something tends to rest at a certain point, if it's displaced from that point, it goes right back to it. And similarly, market forces bring it right back to the equilibrium point. Uh, market forces, in this case, being two things. One is a free price system, in other words, the price system is free to move. And two, uh, desire to, a businessman to make profits and avoid losses. That's all you need. Of course, all businessmen have that desire, otherwise they wouldn't be in business very long. If they, they don't desire to avoid losses, for example, They'll lose a lot of money and be out of business. <clears throat> so then we saw that if the price, for example, is higher <clears throat> than an equilibrium point, then there'll be a certain amount ready to be sold, only much less of it sell sellable to consumers. This will be an unsold surplus, and which will pile up on the shelves, something which all businessmen hate, like the very Dickens, like the like blazes, the stuff they thought was going to sell and so it's piling up unsold. And then they find as they lower the price of it, Lo and behold, more will be sold, so finally, as they keep lowering it, surplus is over. <clears throat> so the way the market eliminates unsold surpluses is by cutting the price, and as the price falls, you go back to the equilibrium point. Conversely, if the price is below the equilibrium point, there will then be <clears throat> a certain amount ready to be sold, but buyers or consumers will want to buy more than that. At that lower price, they want to buy this much, and this is a shortage. In other words, here you have an excess demand. Demand is greater than supply at that price. Shortage means the thing stuff disappears from the shelves and, and break rapidly. And then business then say, hey, this means I can raise the price without worrying about cutting sales. And as they raise the price, the shortage becomes more and more over. So finally, you're back to the equilibrium point. No shortage and no surplus. 
So, so below the, <coughs> the equilibrium price, the man is greater than the supply, excess demand. Above it, supply is greater than the man, in other words, excess supply or unsold surplus. Only at this price <coughs> is the are the man and supply equal. <coughs> in other words, <coughs> it's called clearing the market, where supply and demand are exactly equal. As much are, are is sold as the people want to sell. In other words, business that produces a certain amount, they want to sell it, and this is exactly the amount that the consumer is willing to buy. So this is the price which will be set determined on the market. This is um, in other words, one of the great one of the important things this shows is that even though people who don't understand economics think that the market is chaotic. The prices are chaotic. Nobody knows why prices are set the way they are. It's all unplanned. There's no government planning board which says, okay, you and you produce this much and sell at that price. Instead of that, it works much better than a government planning thing because it works it smoothly and integrates and harmonizes the amount people want to pay for a product with the amount that uh, people will produce. <clears throat> equates supply and demand. So every step of the way, either in consumer goods or producer's goods or raw materials or like mining coal or whatever it is, there's never any shortage or any surplus. There's always an equation of demand and supply. Uh, <clears throat> even though the individuals on the market don't, don't, may not realize this, don't, don't talk about equating supply and demand. That's the way it works in practice. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> that's why Adam Smith said the market works as if there's an invisible hand harmonizing everything. Uh, it, it, it was, uh, doesn't mean there is an invisible hand. It means that's the way it works. <clears throat> Okay, if the price tends to be set at this particular point, what can change it then? If there's an equilibrium price, why do prices change all the time? And the answer there is, of course, that either supply changes or demand curve changes. Those are the only two things that can change price, and we'll see later on. A cost, the change, an increase in cost cannot increase price, only does it through cutting supply, <coughs> because these are the only two factors uh, that, that go into a price determining price. So, uh, if the supply changes, let's say if there's a coffee frost, right now there's a coffee blight, a drought in Brazil. Usually there's a frost every few years. This time there's a big drought. The coffee prices will go up imminently. <clears throat> and uh, so in other words, you then have a big drop in supply. Supply sh curve shifts to the left. It means that the old equilibrium price is now a, <clears throat> a, a shortage. <clears throat> Demand is now greater than supply. Prices therefore go up. You wind up with a new equilibrium price, a higher price, which clears the market. So uh, a decrease in supply, a decrease in the supply of X leads to an increase in the price of X. This shows how prices perform a rationing function. Prices perform two important functions. One is a rationing function, rationing the scarcity. <clears throat> if the scarcity is greater, price goes up. If the scarcity is less, the price is cheaper, down to the point where or if goods are super abundant, like air, then the price is free. You don't have to worry about it because it's always there. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so the greater the... You have, you have a question? No. The greater the relative scarcity, the greater the price. <coughs> Conversely, if, the, if the, the coffee crop is finally adjusted or whatever, comes back in the, the normal situation, then you have an increase in the supply. <coughs> At the old equilibrium price, you don't have a surplus. In order to induce people to buy more, of the, uh, of the of coffee, you have to lower the price. As the price is lowered, you eliminate the surplus. You wind up with a new equilibrium price where the supply is greater and the price is lower. In other words, scarcity is less now, uh, and therefore the price, the rationing thing becomes less intense. An increase in the supply leads to a drop in price. <coughs> um, now, over time, most goods in a, in a free market economy uh, goods tend to increase as you have increased capital investment and better technology. Most goods, have, supply tends to increase, and so prices tend to fall. In other words, the general trend is of falling prices. And you can see that dramatically in, in areas where you have tremendous increase in productivity. I a few years, computers, uh, calculators, uh, TV sets, and things like that, where prices are falling even though you have general inflation, the teeth of general inflation, which means the real prices, in other words, prices in terms of uh, the price level as a whole, are falling even more than you might think. <clears throat> um, and uh, if you consider per quali unit quality, which is the way you really have to think of prices, because a good is homogeneous. Remember, if we define a good as uh, n homogeneous units, supply of a good, sorry, uh, which means that n homogeneous units. So in order to be really homogeneous, you have to have the same quality. Usually in the market, uh, market economy, the Quality improves all the time. As a matter of fact, except for government, in the private capitalist sector, 
quality of goods are always going up, and the quality of TV sets are much better than it used to be. Quality of computers and all that sort of stuff. So the, the, the price fall is much greater than you might think, because it's a tremendous fall per unit, price fall per unit quality. Um, and only in government sector, I think, is the quality always going down, like the post office. Uh, beloved post office used to have used to deliver mail twice a day. It's now once a day, if that. Okay. So as the <laughs> not only are prices going up, not only the price of stamps go up, but the quality goes down with government. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> okay, so that's the uh, that's the supply side of the, of the situation. If you ask the question, if prices are always going, tending to go down, how come prices are always going up in general? The answer is the macro course. That's, you learn that in external or whatever. It's because government keeps pouring more money into the system. In other words, government is like a vast counterfeiter. In fact, it is a vast counterfeiter. It just prints money all the time and creates more money. As it creates more money, of course, prices tend to go up. There's greater demand. In other words, demand curves go up. Everybody's got more money in their pockets than they had before, which tends to offset the fall in prices due to increased productivity. Okay, let's see. So that's the supply side. We now get to demand. <coughs> What can increase the demand curve, change the demand curve? And when we talk about demand increasing or decreasing, we mean the entire curve shifting up or down. And again, I'm going to repeat this again for the nth time. The should not confuse going down or up at the given demand curve with a change in the, on the whole curve. When the supply increases, the price goes down, the quantity demanded goes up. In other words, the quantity sold, pr produced and sold goes up. The quantity demand goes up, but the entire demand curve does not go up. It doesn't change. The reason it doesn't change is the demand curve is defined as the locus of what happens when prices change. In other words, you have a certain amount at any given price, how much will be purchased. So if the price falls, unless you say the demand curve is going to change, which we know there's no reason why it should, as the price falls, the quantity demand goes up, but the demand curve as a whole, the demand as a whole remains constant. The demand curve remains constant. You're going down the given demand curve. So the only thing which cannot increase the demand curve is a change in price. The only thing which can't cut the demand curve is a change in price. Because the demand curve is, is defined as response to prices. Okay. Uh, so that in other words, when the demand curve goes up, why should the demand curve go up? Well, it can go up for many reasons. Either because the government prints more money. Everybody's got more money in their pocket. One reason to go up. The demand curve going up means, technically, at any given price, more will be purchased than the, the, the one before. So whatever the price is, you have an increase in, in purchases. <clears throat> so if everybody's got more money, if the government prints a lot of money and distributes it around uh, by spending, by lending it out, and ripples through the system, <clears throat> then the demand curve will shift upward. Or if there's a big tax cut, let's say, uh, we'll have more money in our pockets, the demand curve will shift upward. Uh, that's one reason for general curves to shift upward. For individual uh, items, it's due to changes in taste, changes in fashion, changes in values. Um, there's all sorts of value changes. It can be important or they could be fr frivolous. The economists don't worry about that. That's up to moralists and whatever, social psychologists, whatever it is. All we register is the fact that the demand curves go up or down. Values change. <coughs> uh, <coughs> they could be, because, for example, uh, it used to be the big game around here, uh, outdoor game was, um, was hula hoops. A big fan of hula hoops one year. And everybody bought hula, big increase in the manga of hula hoops. And then hula hoops drop out and frisbees come in. Big frisbee boom, which I think is probably still going on, frisbees. I don't know. I'm not really up on all of this. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, and then of course a couple of years ago came the famous Cabbage Patch doll caper. Where, I mean, they've been making dolls for hundreds of years and nobody got excited one way. All of a sudden Cabbage Patch doll, that was it. Okay, so, and people, one guy flew to London to buy it because in London they hadn't had this big uh, <laughs> Cabbage Patch doll boom. So he, uh, <clears throat> he had his way paid for. I think his, uh, his wife was a, was a travel agent or something like that, or a stewardess. So, but still, in all, it was obviously very expensive. to schlepped on London to buy, buy a doll for Christmas. <laughs> so it was a big, but it's still going on. And then the question for the Cabbage Patch doll people was, will this continue? Is it a flash in the pan? Well, they have to figure it out. They have to play their hunches, their insight on the market, whatever it is. Uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, and uh, again, as I, as I mentioned, there's been a big shift in values over the last 40 years or so, out of out of pork and into beef, uh, out of uh, dark beer into light beer, out of heavy, red wine into white wine, out of bourbon into vodka, and so forth and so on. So this, these are they shifts up and down. In other words, in some cases, there's a drop and decrease in the demand, demand curve. In other cases, an increase. Okay, so when the demand curve increases, there's a Rise in price, because in other words, at the old price, it means the old price is now a shortage. 
prices are bid up until we get to the to the higher price. When the demand curve falls, there's a drop in there's a drop in means that the old price is now a surplus. People don't want to buy it anymore, and so there's a price fall to induce people to buy the the uh, available supply, and, and the price goes down. Then uh, then we get into the fact that as the demand changes, if the demand is considered change is considered fairly permanent, then there will be a change in supply. Supply in the long run responds to demand. So that in other words, if there's an increase in the demand curve for vodka, then people realize that the vodka makers say, okay, we're going to get out of bourbon. Hell with bourbon. We're going to get into more and more vodka. And as they do that, depending on the technology, how long this takes, it all depends on the individual item, uh, they'll start increasing the supply of vodka. And so over the years, you get something like this. You get a, a price which is somewhere in between, usually, between the, the old and the, and the on the suddenly increased price. Uh, so you wind up then with a higher price, perhaps, and a greater output. In the case of a uh, fall in the man curve, you wind up, you have uh, a big drop in the man for bourbon, and uh, people get, so producers get out of bourbon, and we're going to produce less of that. And then over the years, you don't have a, a lower production and a higher price from the, from the original, so somewhere in between again. So in this way, consumers over the long run, because we didn't see, first we talked about a given supply line. Well, then we, then we start talking about what determines the supply line. It's not God given. It was due to previous decisions by producers, you know, six months ago, a year ago, five years ago, whatever, depending on the, on the good. In the case of liquor or wine, particularly, it takes many years, of course, for wine to ripen and stuff like that. But anyway, over the long run, then you get in the situation where if an increased demand will then induce a greater supply of the product, a lower demand will cause a, a lower supply of the product. So that way, supply production response to consumer demand. And uh, <clears throat> a greater demand will cause greater output and vice versa. Except, of course, in goods which are output are fixed forever, like Rembrandt paintings. Until you get a perfect forgery, which is these days of technology are almost impossible because they can date stuff, you know, things like that. Uh, supply of Rembrandt is dead with, Rem I mean, go on with Rembrandt. So it's absolutely fixed. Certainly can't be increased. Once in a while, you can lose a painting, or somebody can destroy it, but you cannot you cannot increase. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, so that way, uh, supply on the market, production response to consumer demand. First, of what people expect consumer demand will be, and then if the if the producers are right, if, if, if demand is increased, then they'll, they'll make profits. This will spur them to make even more of them. If they're wrong, and it turns out that say the increased demand for vodka was only temporary, then they lose a lot of money and all cut back. So in other words, profits and losses are a signal to producers of whether they're on the right track or not. They make higher profits, they'll increase the demand, they'll increase the production. If they make lower profits or losses, then they'll, then they'll cut back. And so the profits are like a signal uh, whether they're on the right track at serving consumers or not. <clears throat> and later, when we, after the midterm, we'll get into uh, theory of the firm, uh, part three, and uh, we'll get to uh, uh, we'll start talking about costs and production and so on, so on. How, how, how production is determined and how and profits are determined, things like that. Okay, so then we, uh, after that, that sort of covered any given uh, good, then we went into relationships between goods. <coughs> There's uh, the two major ones. Our uh, substitutability, co-substitutes, right? where goods are substitutes for each other in the same, fulfilling the same market. Coffee and tea, cocoa and tea, and that sort of thing. Uh, metals, uh, aluminum and steel. Uh, all these things can fill more or less the same. They're not perfect substitutes, but they're fairly close. Uh, and so what happens, for example, when, when the supply curve of coffee went down, and coffee became more scarce and more expensive, people shifted more and more to tea and, and cocoa. So you then have a, as a result of this, there's an increase in the demand curve for tea, let's say. And the price of tea tended to go up. And cocoa the same way. So uh, we can then say that the uh, an a dec decrease in the supply of X brings about an increase in the price. This increase in the price will, will in turn bring about an increase in demand for Y, the substitute, which in turn will raise the price of Y. <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. You can just change the sign and get the same number. An increase in the supply of X will cause a, a drop in the price of X, cause a drop in the demand for Y, 
a drop on the price. You know, as coffee gets cheaper, let's say, people will shift out of tea into coffee, and the demand curve for tea will go down, the price of tea will fall. And eventually, of course, the output in the long run. <clears throat> um, okay, then there's complements. And a complement, the two goods go together. Instead of being substitutes, sort of battling each other, a complement, they go together. They're either demanded together or produced together. Uh, the case of joint demand, in cases like uh, ham and eggs or steak and steak sauce or bread and butter, things like that, which are demanded together, or baseball caps, baseball gloves, you know, all, all the rest of it, uh, or factors that go in labor and capital and land go into a certain production. If the, if the demand for champagne goes up, you have an increase in the demand for champagne labor, an increase in the demand for champagne machinery and champagne land. All these things will increase, the prices will go up, wage rates will go up in champagne country and so forth and so on. So these are joint demand. And uh, <clears throat> one interesting thing there is what happens when the supply changes to one of these factors. In other words, uh, they say bread and butter to sandwiches. Right? And bread and butter are going to sandwiches. Um, <clears throat> if the uh, price of butter, butter gets cheaper, spectacularly cheaper because of an increase in productivity or fertilizer or whatever, then the price will fall, increase in the supply of X, and this will make sandwiches cheaper, and the result of that will be an increase in demand for bread. And with more sandwiches will be purchased. Uh, but bread hasn't gotten cheaper. I mean, bread is the same supply as before, so the price of bread will go up. And... Uh, so this causes a increase in demand for Y and an increase in the price of Y. And you have, with joint, those in joint demand, this is what happens. <coughs> um, Complements. And of course, again, the sign is reversed. If the, if the supply goes down for, for butter, let's say, there's a big cow shortage or something like that, uh, the price goes up. Which means the demand for sandwiches goes down, which means the demand for bread goes down, the price of bread goes down. So in, the, in both cases, the price is going in opposite directions here. Uh, between the two factors. When the supply is the, is, the, is the source of the chain. When demand is the source of the chain, it's easy to see what happens. All the demand curves go up or, or go down, that's it. In the case of supply, however, it gets a little trickier. <clears throat> uh, and the other, the other jointness, the other complement was, was joint supply, where two goods are simply produced together. They're found together in nature. Uh, beef and hides are the famous example. Uh, cattle, beef cattle are killed for meat. And also, of course, there's their skin, which is used for leather, hides or leather. And, uh, same way with copper and, and, um, silver, which are found together and so forth and so on. Um, and here, here what happens is that you have a response. In other words, when, when there's an increase in demand for beef over time, when the demand curve goes up, uh, Supply then goes up in the long run, and you get then, as a result of that, an increase in the supply of, of hide or leather, which causes a drop on the price. So, uh, this, uh, this is a, this. In other words, demand for X goes up, increase in demand for B, let's say, and uh, this increases the price, which in turn increases the supply of, of X in the long run. And this, in turn, increases the supply of Y, which, which lowers the price of Y. That's the way they schematize that. And, of course, again, you reverse the signs, and the exact opposite happens in every case. Uh, okay, so this, this, gets in, this finishes the relationship between goods. And then we talk about what happens when the government interferes in this process. A whole bunch of case studies about that. This can be summed up as either maximum price control or minimum price control. We always talk about cartels a little bit, but that's not going to be on the... That'll be next after the midterm. Going more into that. In maximum price control, <clears throat> which is more common, um, the government orders that you can't sell a, a good above a certain price, which is it was a, below the free, the, 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 the smart equilibrium price, free market equilibrium price. This is maximum price control, which puts us tries to lower the price below the equilibrium by force. In other words, putting a putting a floor on it, a ceiling on it. Excuse me. Uh, on, uh, on preventing it from going up. One well, of the situations we saw this caused all sorts of problems. First place, it causes a shortage. Since the, it means the shortage cannot be eliminated in the market. You have a permanent shortage, which, which gets worse over time as the supply goes down uh, because of unprofitability of the whole product. 
in it. And uh, then you have black markets, which are at a very high price, but they're very scarce. They can't advertise, they have to pay off the cops and all that. You have like a black mar small black market around the edges, <coughs> and a decline in them rationing through lining up, so be on a waiting list or standing in line. Because this has to be rationed in some way. If the price system can't ration, it's got to be done through coercion, through ration tickets or and or standing in line through favoritism, through uh, the producer taking over racial and religious discrimination because the producer that can, because the producer's in the salary, he doesn't worry, worry about, about, per, about customers. There are plenty of, too many customers. Then he can ration customers. He says, okay, I like this guy, and this guy's, this guy's my brother-in-law. This guy's not the same race as I am. How about everybody else? So this is, uh, these are all, and also the decline in quality. A hidden price increase is a quality of decline, which cannot be policed. It's almost impossible, except for certain visible things. But police the decline in quality, figure out, is there, is there really less almonds now than used to be in a ch chocolate almond crunch ice cream? So, uh, and of course it doesn't really cure inflation. And usually maximum price, in, price growth is supposed to cure inflation. It doesn't do that at all. It simply makes things worse. Inflation is caused by an increase in the man curves do the increase in money supply, which keeps bubbling along merrily anyway. Um, the minimum price control, the government keeps the price above the equilibrium point, free market equilibrium, and this perpetuates a surplus. In other words, instead of a surplus being eliminated quickly through the price system, but now if this is a minimum price on the price floor, perpetuates an unsold surplus. Uh, in many cases, the surplus gets worse over time because the producers will produce more of it. Hey, the price is pretty good here. It calls forth an even greater surplus which the government has to handle in some way. The two big examples of this are the farm price support program. The total mess and getting worse as the surpluses keep piling up. And minimum wage laws which create unemployment among marginal, among the lowest paid workers. Um, examples of Maximum price control are legion. There, there are not only things like meat control in World War II and all sorts of other things. There's also uh, water sh the water shortage caused by water price control, the traffic ingestion caused by tr price of traffic, so to speak, being virtually zero, price of driving and whatever. Uh, and all sorts of other stuff, rent control, which, cause, which is, causes housing short apartment shortage and causes all sorts of ways to try to evade the, uh, the regulations. <clears throat> and, uh, all these things are examples of, of price control and price control in action. Um, that really, uh, I guess, sums up the course. I haven't let you much time for a question, but any, are any, uh, any questions in any part of the course? Any of the stuff? No, you all know it perfectly. Magnificent. Okay, good luck. <laughs> well, I just got back from Europe, so I have not been able to, I haven't seen the exams yet, but I will test, I will mark them by Thursday and give them back. Went to Europe. Well, I went to Poland, the conference in Poland, and, uh, in London and tour, toured around the continent a bit. But basically, it was a Polish conference. And, uh, no, no, I mean, our school? Good heavens, no. <laughs> Just be kidding. No, this is, uh, it was organized, financed from London, <clears throat> organized from London. And um, so uh, the Polish, uh, the Polish scholars there were all, all against the government. It was heroic. Just it was very openly. It was known, even though it was probably an apparatchik spy and, and at the time they didn't care. No, they probably apparently they're they're very outspoken. There are no Polish intellectuals in favor of the government now. So it's, it's sort of like a peculiar kind of equilibrium, as they said, that they were that they they just the government realized that and didn't do anything about it. So it's a very odd situation. <clears throat> it's probably apparently this is the only place in Eastern Europe where they could have had a conference of this sort. Uh, even in Hungary, where they which is much freer economically, uh, is not as intellectually free. So that was very interesting. So, so anyway, it was, it was heartwarming to see. I mean, the whole, the whole country is sort of falling apart, but at least they're intellectually you know, in good shape. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you can't get any Wonder Bread. You can't get any American or English papers either, so it's kind of a news blackout. <clears throat> uh, at any rate, to return to our uh, the muttons here, <laughs> the... Uh, Okay, we're into the, the theory of the firm, and every <clears throat> the objective of each firm is to maximize their profits, uh, or rather to have as high a profit as they can to avoid losses. Uh, profits are equal to total revenue minus total cost. In other words, over a year period, let's say, you take any time period, the money you take in minus the money you pay out. And this, of course, gets very complicated in practice, but in theory, it's pretty simple. Understand. If you take in 1.5 million dollars and you pay out 1.0 million, <clears throat> then you have a profit of 500,000. Okay? 
if you're unfortunately pay out a million dollars and take in only 0.5, then you have losses of $500,000. So everybody's trying to, every business firm, business entity, tries to maximize their profit, increase their profits and avoid losses. They can't always do that. Losses often pop up, largely because the costs are paid out immediately before the money is, is, is taken in. In other words, you have, to, you have to build your plant, whatever it is, you have to buy your workers, buy raw material, get all the stuff together, and then try to sell the product, <clears throat> and then try to sell the product at a profit. So the payout comes now, and the, and the income comes later, and there's often, of course, a big slip here. There's, there's consumers don't always do what the, or buyers don't always do what the investors think they're going to do. So they often make losses, and they try, of course, very hard not to. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so this is the, and this goal of trying to maximize profits and avoid losses drives the whole economic free market system and, and equilibrates everything, equilibrates supply and demand as we saw in the first part of the course at each step of the way because everybody's trying to increase profits and avoid losses. It's a very simple but effective motivation on the part of a businessman, especially in the fact that the businessman has already paid out the money and doesn't want to lose it. So it's a very powerful uh, incentive. <clears throat> um, now th there's been questions, uh, not so much among economists, some economists, a small minority, Mostly among intellectuals, sociologists, people of that ilk, writers, uh, literary types, claiming that, well, it's, maybe it's true in the 19th century the business, business firms wanted to maximize profits, but now it's not true anymore. Now the managers have taken over. Uh, and managers don't care about profits, so they just want to have a minimal amount. <clears throat> um, they want to increase the size of their operations, they want a quiet life, or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, most of this is, uh, is generally a lot of nonsense. As a matter of fact, it works the other way around. As the corporation gets bigger, there's less and less of the sort of mom and pop kind of motivation. In other words, if you're, if you're say, if you own a grocery store you know, with, with two employees, uh, your wife might persuade you to hire your incompetent brother-in-law. You know, you know he's incompetent, and he's losing money for you, but still in order to keep peace in the family, you hire him anyway. So there's a lot of that goes on in family businesses. But with a corporation, as the, as the, Firms get larger and get incorporated. There's much less of that. There's some of that, of course, but much less of it because you have to satisfy stockholders. You have to. You haven't got sort of a personal operation anymore. So the drive for maximizing money profits is even stronger in corporations than it is with, with personal uh, firms. But there's also a drive to keep peace and you know pers private utility takes over. Psych psychic utility, in some cases, more important than money profit. <clears throat> well, obviously, you have to have a certain. You can't make losses because then you go out of business. So uh, the drive for maximizing money and profit is even stronger with corporations than it is with personal mom and pop firms, so to speak. <clears throat> um, the idea that the managers have taken over, which is, it was, came out with a famous book by Burley and Means, two new dealers in 1930, 30, I think it was. It was called The Modern Corporation and Private Property, a very famous book. <clears throat> They were neither, well, Means, I guess, was sort of an economist, although I sort of question it. But Burley was a corporate lawyer. <clears throat> Their thesis was that the, in modern corporate firms, the managers have taken over. The stockholders are no longer important. They don't count. The managers sort of seize power. And what they want is essentially increasing the size of the company or, or they don't, don't care much about profits, <clears throat> status, whatever, you know, whatever the motivations uh, are. <clears throat> uh, this, I think, is refutable fairly easily. <clears throat> uh, it's true the managers often don't care that much about profits. On the other hand, if they don't make, uh, if they don't make profits, if their profit, uh, if their earning ratio doesn't, doesn't look too hot, the stockholders first of all get sore. And the getting sore doesn't necessarily mean they'll kick them out. It, it, it is difficult to kick out managers. You know, uh, there's, there's there's like a little political machine. The stockholders have to get together and organize. There's, there's a lot of them. There's maybe a couple, two million stockholders in some in a big co corporation. They don't have to organize. The interesting thing about a corporation is all the stockholders have to do to ex exert their power is to vote with their pocketbook. In other words, sell the stock. So if you own 10 shares or 100 shares of General Motors stock, you think General Motors is not doing very well, its profits are low, etc. You just sell the stock and buy something else. The act of selling the stock drives down the price of the stock and makes the managers very upset because they, you know, they don't like the fact that the, the, the value of their stock is going down. <laughs> also, so selling the stock is a sort of a key thing here. <clears throat> so long before the stockholders start organizing to kick out the managers and get somebody else in, they sell the stock and the value of the shares goes down. 
The managers also own shares. After all, managers get paid partly in shares of a co co corporation, especially with income tax the way it is. They don't have to pay money on the shares of stock. <clears throat> so a top, a top president of a corporation might make $200,000 in salary and $500,000 in shares of stock of a, of a company. So he, he himself is a stockholder and is worried about, he doesn't like to see the value of the stock going down. <clears throat> so it works very in a very quick, smooth fashion. You don't have to have the big dramatic vote. <clears throat> um, in contrast to that, of course, is government operation. We should always, almost, almost, we should always con contrast and compare government with private enterprise. And a government fir quote firm, government agency, say the post office, right, the beloved postal service, or the transportation authority, we can't sell our, sell our shares in it. We're supposed to be owners. We, the people, are alleged owners of a public corporation. Uh, we're taxpayers and they're citizens, therefore owners. We can't sell our share if we don't like Metropolitan Transit Authority. We don't like the way the rotten subway system is run. We can't sell our shares in this because we ain't got no shares. We can't sell our shares in the rotten post office either. If we could do that, it would be a very different situation. We'd keep the managers on their toes. But the managers get paid from the, from the taxpayer. They don't care. There's no shareholders to worry about. So shareholders exert an enormous amount of power, even without voting. Because voting is just a, a, a small part of it. By selling their shares, by the value of the shares going down, they register the you know, the signal to the manager, you better shape up, fella, because you're going to lose out. <clears throat> so <clears throat> selling shares of stock is very important. <clears throat> um, stock market every day evaluates and reevaluates corporations with them without fear or favor. They don't care about the fact that guy's been a, he's a beloved, he's been a member of the Union League Club, has been entrenched for 30 years. They don't care about that. If the profit uh, prospects are bad, they start selling their share, and the stock the value goes down. <clears throat> um, also, of course, in addition to selling the stock, which is the key thing, keeping managers, managers honest, is the is so-called takeover bid, as you see uh, very dramatically. But if, 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 the, if the share of stock gets low, in other words, if, the, if, you, if, the, if it's basically a sound corporation but being badly managed, <clears throat> and the value of the share goes way down, this becomes a tempting for takeover bids, for, for other capitalists to say, look, to write letters to the shareholders and say, look, get us in there, we'll, we'll take, this, take this company, we'll make a big profit out of it, and we prove our, our, uh, our, our judgment and our capacity for making profits by giving you a much bigger deal and you're getting better deal than you're getting now. Let's say the, if the value of a share of a corporation is, say, $70 a share, we'll pay you $100 a share if you get us in, if you sell us enough shares so we can take over. So this is a powerful incentive. It's also a powerful, powerful incentive for the existing managers to shape up and not let the corporation run down and not make profits. Otherwise, somebody will come in with a takeover bid. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> liberals and the, the liberal media, the establishment, so to speak, is always in favor of the managers. If you notice this, next time you notice about a takeover bidder, they always hate the, the takeover bidder. Takeover bidder is a, is a corporate raider, he's a pirate, he's a, he comes from Texas, which sort of automatically makes him evil. Uh, and he's displacing these beloved managers who've been here for 30 years. Well, that's, that's the whole point of, of capitalism and the market economy. You're being displaced if you do a lousy job. And so this, this is what competition is all about. It's interesting that liberals who tend to be, who purport, who propounded the idea that the terrible thing managers are taking over from stockholders, when it gets down to the bone and the stockholders revolt, they're always in favor of the managers against the stockholders. It's an interesting little item here. <clears throat> uh, any change in the status quo they consider somehow disrupting <clears throat> and, and bad in some sense. Of course, the managers are there telling the, they're there, the existing manager, the president of whatever corporation is being, is being under a quote, attack, unquote, from a takeover bid, is, is giving interviews to the New York Times or the Post or whatever it is, and CBS, and saying, look, it's a terrible thing. These guys are from Texas, and they're evil. Guys from Texas aren't here and established, and therefore they don't have the access to the media that, 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 the, that the local people do. <clears throat> so that's, that's, uh, so there's always a poison atmosphere against the, the newcomers, reinforced often by court decisions. Of course, the lawyers are, are in there all the time. Every, every one of these guys has fleets of corporate lawyers battling on the courts for years to try to stop uh, takeover bids to try to, you know, try to facilitate them. <clears throat> but anyway, the takeover bid has been a powerful weapon in keeping the managers on their toes and kicking them out if they don't do a lousy job. So you don't have to wait for the stockholders themselves to organize and get together. The takeover bidder says, T-Bone Pickens or whoever it is, comes in and says, okay, I'm going to buy Carl Icahn, whatever these guys are. They come in and say, okay, we're going to buy this corporation. We think it's doing a lousy job. We can do a lot better. We'll pay the shareholder $30 on the share, which is a powerful incentive. <clears throat> so, um, Anyway, through, this, through, the, through these methods, through takeover bids, especially through selling stock, 
stockholders are the effectual, uh, effectively the directors or runners, owners of the corporation, not the managers. Although the managers get the publicity, of course, on a day-to-day basis. Of course, if I own one share of General Motors, I'm not going to have much of a say in it, obviously. I'm not saying each individual stockholder, except through selling stock as a share, as a, as a power. But if you have, like, say, 10% of the stock, or a group of people have 10 or 15%, you can basically run it. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, if the manager does a lousy job, you not, might, might not want to run it anymore. You might want to sell it to somebody else who comes over with a takeover bid. <clears throat> so in this way, this, the, the uh, stock market works in such a way as to, as to, as to make the market economy as efficient as possible, <clears throat> as profitable and as efficient and serving the consumers as, as humanly possible. <clears throat> and sh- keeping, ma- making the managers shape up. That's true, the managers do try to finagle from time to time. Uh, for example, the, uh, <clears throat> when you, when you, when you uh, estimate your profits, <clears throat> during inflation, let's say you have a, uh, a million dollar machine, and you, you spent a million dollars on it, <clears throat> say in 1980, and let's say it's a 10 year machine, so it'll be, it'll, it'll, 1990 is going to have to be replaced. Orthodox accounting methods, this is, I think I've referred to this in the past here, this, this there's a constant war between, account, war between accountants and economists. It's been going on for about 40 years since the modern age of inflation has come, gotten underway. If you buy a machine for a million dollars, you're supposed to evaluate it on the books at a million dollars. That's what's called historical cost accounting. And then if, um, in other words, this is what you actually pay for. You paid a million bucks. And then 10 years later, if you have to replace it, uh, you depreciate, say, 100000 a year, so you have a fund of a million dollars to buy another one. Uh, so this is all very well if there's no inflation. Okay? But if you have a chronic inflation, as we've had now since, like, since World War II, this is gonna, not going to work. This distorts the actual picture of a corporate firm. Because, let's say prices have doubled in these 10 years, which is not unusual. Prices, in fact, have gone up eight-fold since 1940, three-fold since, uh, triple since 1967, okay? triple in the last 20 years. So if they double in these 10 years, and you, you, you take your million bucks, in 1990, to replace the machine, you find you can, you can only buy half of it. You need another million to, to replace it. So that the replacement cost, which is really the important thing, who cares about the historical cost? It's interesting for historians. But if, you're, if, you, if it now costs $2 million because of inflation, it means you're wiping out your capital. In other words, you think you made a big profits, but you really haven't. In other words, let's say if you, you think your profit is $5 million this year, but it's only because you have to replace a couple of machines and you're, and you're, you're reckoning it as a million, but it really costs two million. You really made very, very little profits. In other words, this is profit of, you, you overinflate, you inflate how much profit you make because you don't take into account the increase in capital cost, increase in, in, in cost of replacement of machinery. <clears throat> so ever since inflation started after World War II, the economists have been telling accountants, look, this is, this is great if you don't have inflation, but it's distorting the whole picture. Accountants are finally beginning to come around after about 40 years. <clears throat> To realizing they've got to do something. That's true. It gets sloppy. You see, if you if you, if you base it as a million, if you paid a million bucks for it, you have a check in 1980 saying, okay, I paid a million dollars for this. This is objective. It's, it's precise. If you're trying to estimate how much inflation is, it's not objective. It's not precise, as we see in macro courses. It's very it's it's very imprecise. But still, you have to do something because otherwise you're going to be wiped out. Your capital investments are going to be wiped out. So as a result, what happens is over the years there's been a connivance between, of course, accountants who've been large in the 19th century accounting methods, <clears throat> pre-inflationary accounting methods. The government, the IRS, which always wants to have tax more, if you think there's higher profits, it means the government can tax it away. And managers who like to fool their stockholders into thinking that profits are high. Managers don't like to tell their stockholders, look, it looks like there's high profits. It's really been eaten away by inflation. There's been sort of a conspiracy <clears throat> for many years of accountants man- top managers in the government, each one trying to bolster the old accounting um, um, Accounting cost system, but as I say, after about 30 or 40 years, finally it's begun to sunk in. It's more or less shifting now toward a, a more rational accounting system. But anyway, this is the one of the, one of the pitfalls here, and it's some ways in which the, which at least in the short run, uh, top managers try to fool the stockholders. It doesn't work for you know forever. It's at least it's sort of a short run advantage. <clears throat> of course, Burley and Means didn't talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> the um, the places, again, where the, where, the, where the managers really take over is, of course, the government, but there's almost no check at all. You can't sell your share in the post office, and therefore and the taxpayer gets sucked in, doesn't know what's going on. And the managers, the government managers, government bureaucrats can then rock, go 
ride high, wide, high, wide, and handsome. Uh, there's also another uh, there's a famous attack on the idea of maximizing profits, <coughs> uh, the so-called questionnaire method. <coughs> These are sociologists who go around to businessmen. They go to, say, the president of the chairman of the board and say, uh, is, your, is it your goal, sir, to maximize profits? Of course they're going to say no. I mean, you know, it sounds terrible. No, no, my goal is not to maximize profits. My goal is to help the world and the country and, and God and all that sort of stuff. And, I mean, <laughs> and we'd like to stay in business to be able to do that. <laughs> okay. So this is not the way you go. And then they, they conclude from this, the sociologists, that therefore business is not in favor of maximizing their profits. This is not the sort of question you ask. Paul Samuels, I'm not a great friend of Paul Samuels, but in his textbook on economics, he did, he, I think, he did an effective two-paragraph smash of this. What he said was, look, what you, what you ask a businessman is this. You don't ask him, are you in favor of maximizing your profits? You say, looking, sir, looking back on your decision, decisions that you made last year, you know, all your business decisions, is there any one decision where you deliberately avoided making profits? Where you said, no, I'll take a, I'll take a cut in profits. A businessman always says, why should I do that? Why should I do a crazy thing like that? Of course not. So in other words, you take the marginal approach. You break it down into marginal units. You say, in each of these 50 decisions that you made, in each one you try, you didn't, you, you didn't try, you try, you try to increase your profits as much as you could on that. Make as much profit as you could and not try to cut your profits. And they're, they're, of course, conceding the fact that your goal is to maximize profits. So the, you, it depends on the way you put it. You, know, you put it in the, in the sense of looking at each decision, what did you do? And you, you get a rational answer, of course. That's uh, basically it. You don't, you don't get a guff about the public welfare and, and, and country, your country and stuff like that. So at any rate, so the, the goal of each business firm is to increase your profits as much as you can and to avoid losses. Okay. <clears throat> um, total revenue... <clears throat> First of all, we start. Well, I want to. Oh, I should say. Uh, read. I was going to bring in the readings. Read the stuff. Does anybody have the book here? The Miller book. The readings. The next set of readings. I think I have it on the syllabus. If anybody see the syllabus, uh, <laughs> it's the. Uh, I think chapter nine. I'll tell you next time. It's. I have it in my briefcase. Just. Uh, it's. It's a chapter on. Pro oh. Ah. Thank you. Great. It's. Um, yeah, this is chapter. This is part three, chapters four, nine, ten, twelve, and fourteen. Um, uh, the, I, it gets to the, well, at this point, up until this point, I've been more or less green with the book. Now, except I, I don't have a lot of stuff the book has. I don't talk about. From now on, it gets to be much more divergent because the uh, although this, Miller is better than most other books on this, on this topic, because the people who write textbooks are mired in the tradition. They, they have to present a certain apparatus, even though they don't agree with it, <coughs> and at least they feel they do. <coughs> so uh, I'm going to take a much shorter and more common sense view of this whole situation. And uh, the, um, so bear, so uh, this is important for you, because you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to worry about a nine -tenths of, uh, two thirds to nine tenths of the material you're going to read, because I'm not going to talk about it. And if I don't talk about it, it's not going to be on a test. Okay. Uh, can you start with... The basic diagram here is on the, the y-axis, instead of price, and y-axis is dollars, which is sort of like price, except now it's just total dollars. X-axis, quantity of goods, the usual quantity, and the x-axis. If you're a business firm, you sell a certain, you're making a certain product, whatever it is. If you don't sell anything, you're not going to get anything. You're not going to get any income. Okay, so you start with zip. You start at the point of origin. <clears throat> Sell zero. If I sell zero steel bars, I get zero revenue from it. <coughs> uh, the um, a total revenue, as we've seen up until, up until now in the course, of course, is price times quantity. And this, of course, is the demand curve. That's also the price on the y, on the y-axis, and whatever it is, the quantity x-axis, whatever the slope is. So we know that total revenue is the area, okay, so the, and it depends on the elasticity of the demand curve, which can be whatever it is, it can be anything, as long as it's falling. <clears throat> well, if you have, if the price is falls, here's quantity and price. These are two basic diagrams. The old diagram we're familiar with, price on the y-axis, quantity on the x-axis. And this is the new one, dollars on the y-axis and quantity on the x-axis. Here's a business firm that's making whatever it is, widgets. If it makes certain amount, it sells at a certain price, and this is the point here. If it lowers the price and increases the quantity to here, total revenue will change to whatever it is. <clears throat> if, the, if it's elastic, in other words, if the total revenue goes up, 
as the, as the price for, as the price falls, if this is fairly flat, then we depict it on this diagram. Quantity increases from here to here. Total revenue goes up. Obviously, it has to go up from zero anyway, right? And we can't get lower than zero. So total revenue, we start with a rising total revenue curve. This is TR as quantity increases. <clears throat> and it keeps going up to a certain extent, whatever. It finally gets to the point, let's say, as quantity increases where um, total revenue falls. Right? It becomes inelastic after a certain zone. Uh, and when that happens, you have a dip. In other words, it reaches a peak, the total revenue now falls. This is the this part of the curve is the elastic demand curve zone, by definition. In other words, when the quantity increases, price goes up, and total revenue increases, that means it's elastic. When the total revenue declines when the price, when the quantity goes up and the price falls, this means it's inelastic. This is the inelastic zone. Now the textbooks all have, this is their curve. They have a one peak curve. It doesn't have to be one peak. No, God does not, does not decree it has to be one peak. It could start going up again. It could be two peaks. Or whatever. Okay. This, I prefer this kind of a curve because it shows that uh, there's no reason why it has to be one peak except convenience of the guy who right draws the diagram. Okay. So this is, in this case, this would be elastic again, and this would be inelastic after this. Okay. So it's an n peak total revenue curve. In this case, it's two. I admit that it's more convenient to have one peak, but it tends to mislead the, the reader and the student because you tend to think, well, somehow the, somebody decreases to only one peak. It doesn't have to be. It can be inelastic and elastic and inelastic again and whatever. Total cost, as Professor Hoppe, I think, mentioned to you the, in the last lecture. Uh, again, in the diagram, what you have is in the textbook, you have dollars on the y axis, quantity on the x axis, quantity of goods. You have a total cost curve. In the first place, the total cost curve it goes like that. It doesn't, it's not really, it doesn't have to be like that. God did not decree it has to be like that. It could be almost anything. In other words, um, it could be higher, it could be lower. Uh, if you want to increase cost, if you're paid to increase cost, you'll do it. Very easy. If a businessman loves to have the government tell them, let's say, increase your cost and we will recompense you for it. This is essentially the cost plus defense contract kind of system. Uh, defense con Firms love defense contracts because they can get a guaranteed profit at a cost plus rate. In other words, government tells you, look, whatever your costs are, we will give you, we'll pay you back plus 8% profit or whatever it is. It's not the percentage that counts, it's the fact that the cost of guaranteed, the profit is guaranteed. So if the cost, if the cost, if the government will reimburse everybody's costs, what the hell? Let, let her rip. You know, have beautiful offices. It's very easy to, to, to increase costs. <laughs> The pleasure. It's tough to, de to, cut, to cut costs. That's very difficult. You start paying high salaries. You hire a lot of engineers. If you notice, for example, that the defense contract advertisements for engineers are much, much bigger than, than non-defense firms because they, their, their advertising costs are repaid by the government. What the hell? The government pays your advertising costs for engineers. Let her have, get full page ads in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Engineers come to glorious California. Okay. Uh, if you're a private if you're a firm which has to make it in the free market, you can't afford to do that. <clears throat> you have to be more modest. Uh, so if, if you can convince the government that these, these are reasonable costs, in other words, you need, you need engineers, it's certainly reasonable to have ads, then you can let her rip. Of course, what's reasonable is very elastic. It depends on whether you're the buddy of the guy of the, of the defense, defense department. Uh, usually you are. And so the whole thing is very cozy, and the costs tend to escalate like that. That's why you have the... $6,000 coffee machines and that sort of stuff. <laughs> because there's no, there's no market, there's no market test, there's no market test saying you're going to lose the defense contracts, the defense firm will, will go out of business or the Pentagon will go out of business if they lose money. Un Uncle Sap, the taxpayer, that thus pays the bill. Okay, so they, they, therefore it goes all, it skyrockets. This cost curve in the textbook is only when the firm is trying desperately to cut costs so as to avoid losses and was to keep the total cost at a minimum. Uh, as low as possible, so that they'll, have, they'll make profits. <clears throat> so this cost curve is the envelope, it's the lower end, the minimum envelope of, a, of an array of possible costs. In other words, it's the lowest cost at any given quantity produced. And the reason why business firms will, will operate the lowest cost is because it's their economic interest to do so, to try to make profits and avoid losses. They will try their damnedest to keep their costs as low as possible for any given output. That's why you have the cost curve. If you didn't have 
the free market incentive to avoid losses and make profits, the cost can be any place. It's, it'll skyrocket. You know, this, this, you know, $5,000 coffee machines and $20 nails and that sort of thing. <clears throat> it can be almost anything. <clears throat> so that's one thing. We have a minimum, it's a lowest, it's a minimum envelope of possible costs. <clears throat> um, the other thing is, that the next, next point of dispute here is, my contention is if you don't make any widgets. I'm not a widget manufacturer. I make zero widgets per year. Zero steel bars, zero stereo sets. Therefore, my costs are zero. There's no such thing as fixed costs. It's all baloney. Okay. In other words, you start again at the point of origin. Zero, zero quantity, zero cost. And it's true that there are different kinds of indivisibilities we'll get into later in costs. Uh, you, you build a plant, you have a fixed cost of operation, even if you don't Produce any widgets, but you don't have to have a plant. You can sell the damn plant. You, you, you can you can get out. You can shut it down. You don't have to have fixed costs. There's no such thing as fixed costs. They're all different degrees of variability. So you can toss out all this fixed variable stuff, which unfortunately is at the heart of much microeconomic textbooks. And what you got really is this: you have total costs, which start a total cost curve, the minimum and the lowest envelope of possible costs in any given quantity. And start at the point of origin, total cost zip. And my contention is, which I have now have to prove, okay, is the total cost always go up. In other words, that total cost uh, always increase as quantity increases. So this is not self-evident. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, many people think, well, gee, it's not true. Isn't there? Aren't there? Uh, cost of large scale production. Note the cost curve goes down. Not total cost, however. Average cost goes down, as we'll see. Total cost keeps going up. And this can be proven logically. In other words, while total revenue can either go up or down, depending on, because there are two forces at work. Remember, total revenue is prices and there's quantity, each going in different directions. Price goes down, quantity goes up. And there's a tug of war to see what happens to total revenue. It can either go up or down. Total costs, are, on the other hand, are always going up. Okay, let's uh, we'll prove it by. Reductio ad absurdum is the easiest way to demonstrate this. In other words, to show that any anything else is illogical and absurd. <clears throat> Let's take um, this is quantity produced total cost. Uh, let's say uh, the, here they have a business business firm is producing 100 cases, 100 widgets, 100 steel bars, whatever the unit happens to be. Let's assume it is total, it's minimum total cost. Remember, this is minimum, the lowest envelope. The minimum total cost is, I don't know, $5,000. Okay? Doesn't matter what it is. Now the firm makes another unit and increases quantity to, say, 101. <clears throat> what I'm saying is it's illogical and absurd to say that the total cost goes down to, say, 4500 It's impossible. It's logically impossible. For this reason, <clears throat> if your, total, your minimum total cost is $5,000 for making 100 <clears throat> and and you make 101, you have to produce, uh, to say that the total cost goes down, okay, means you can, you can, you can, you can take the 40, you can, uh, let's, let's put it this way. Um, but if you say that, look, I'm saying this is impossible for this reason, I'll demonstrate it this way. If this is if, if the minimum total cost for producing 101 is 4,500, it means you could take you could produce the 101 for 4,500. You could throw away one, and you left them. But this is 4,500 and not at 5,000. In other the initial conditions of the problem are impossible. You know what I mean? In other words, it's impossible to say that if you increase the production that you lower the total cost, because then you can take the lower total cost, throw one away, throw the extra one away, and you left them with 4,500. You can't. The initial conditions of the problem are then violated. <clears throat> So, and you can't even have it the same because at least, because one more costs something, even if it's a little bit, even if the, you know, the, the material on the one widget will cost a few cents. You know, you should, it can't even be the same. Then, you can take that and you can throw that away. So therefore, the amount, the total cost always have to go up. In other words, remember, this is the minimum total cost. The minimum can't be 5,000 and this can't be less then because, as I said, if you can't, you can, then, you can then produce the, the 101, pocket the one, and then you have this will be 4,500, not 5,000. Okay, so this is an illogical, illogical situation. Violates the conditions of the problem. 
So therefore, total costs always have to go up, even by a little bit. Uh, the economies of large-scale production do not, do not apply to total costs, they apply to average, co average total costs, which is very different. It's total cost per unit that goes down for large-scale production, not total cost period. <clears throat> so this always is going up from the point of origin, which is zero, on up. So then the business firm has got to pick the maximum profit point. The maximum profit point will be the, the largest distance between total revenue and total cost, say that or this. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, the conditions for it, the, and this, this is what gets in all the average and marginal stuff which the textbooks are filled with. The conditions for, say, take, take this as a maximum dif distance uh, between total revenue and total cost. Uh, those of you who have taken differential calculus will be, we begin to see the analogies here. Uh, at this point, of, well, the, there's a maximum difference between these two. The slope of the, uh, the slope of the, the tangent of the slope, excuse me, yeah, the tangent of the slope will be the, will be equal. The tangents between, of this, of total cost curve and, and the total revenue curve will be the same at the maximum distance. This is the, uh, <coughs> this is, uh, the tangent. It's delta change in TR divided by delta Q. And this is change in TC divided by delta Q. <clears throat> uh, this is also known as marginal revenue. The change in total revenue, whether increase or decrease, with one more unit of quantity is the marginal revenue. And the change in total cost, which of course is always going up, remember, is one more unit of cost, the marginal cost. At the, where these two things are, the slope is the same, the marginal revenue and marginal cost are equal. This is the whole, this is the famous marginal revenue and marginal cost. Uh, criterion. All it's really saying is it's not saying anything else than the total revenue, uh, the total profits are maximized. In other words, with this kind of curves, this is maximized when <clears throat> this is profits. This is maximized when uh, marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. And MR is delta TR over delta Q. MC is delta, delta TC over delta Q. Where you have, when the change is infinitely, this is where differential calculus comes in, when the change is infinitely, infinitely small, infinitesimally small, excuse me, then this becomes first derivative, dtr versus over dq, etc. Unfortunately, in human action, you don't have infinitesimally small steps. Therefore, calculus is really illegitimate in this situation. However, it's, this, is, uh, this is my gripe with mathematical economics in general. But this is where this thing comes from. With the taking infinitely small steps, it will get then uh, its first derivative, delta dtr, uh, marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. <clears throat> but you're not saying anything more, notice. You're not saying anything more of interest than, than simply you're trying to maximize profit. This is a criterion for maximizing profit. That's all there is to it. This is a whole shtick. This is a whole, this is millions of words are wasted in and economics works on this whole topic. Another problem with this is once you realize there might be more than one peak, this, this could also be a minimum. And this could also identify a minimum point, minimum profit point, or it could be another maximum. So which is better? So you can only you can only find out which is better, which is minimum, which is maximum by inspecting the total. Get back to the total again. Minimum. So the marginal stuff really misleads you more than anything else. So it's an interesting way of looking at it. It's sort of a, in many ways, helpful to show what's going on. That you're interested, in, you're interested in each step of the way of, of making a profit. That your marginal revenue is at least greater, or at least more, no, no, no less than the marginal cost at any, for any decision, economic business decision. You want to make sure you get you're taking in at least as much as you're paying out. Hopefully, of course, more. But the main point is that the total is really the key. The key is you're trying to make total profits. The rest of the stuff is, is you can see how the mathematical economists get wrapped up in this. They get they get fascinated by the tangencies, by slopes, and all that sort of stuff. But it's really all subordinate to the main problem. Businessman cares about profits and losses. He doesn't really care about the other stuff. And this is why when economists talk to businessmen, they'll break down a communication. What do you mean by marginal? He doesn't understand what marginal cost is, marginal. And for, for good reason. Most of it is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, periphery, frippery, I would say. Useless frippery on the main, on the main topic. <clears throat> At any rate, so if you have more than, especially as I say, if you have more than one peak, you can get into big trouble by only talking about marginal because it could easily be a minimal profit. And so you have to, the only way to make sure by looking at the actual totals. <clears throat> so the whole point here is to say maximize total revenue minus total cost, and the 
equality of marginal revenue and marginal cost is, is a is an interesting property of a of a maximum profit situation. Uh, <clears throat> okay, the um, <clears throat> this gives us our marginal marginal revenue and marginal cost. Marginal revenue is <clears throat> delta T P R over delta Q. And when delta, delta Q is one, of course, it becomes very easy to look, you know, just delta T R. And marginal cost is delta T C over delta Q. Let's see. Um, the other thing, that the average comes in, again, it's, it's fairly simple now. The uh, average revenue is TR over Q. It's the average revenue per unit. Average revenue per unit produced. That's the same thing as price. In other words, if you're, <laughs> if you're selling uh, five cases of widgets at $5,000, you're selling $1,000 per case. That's, that's what price is. This is our demand curve, in other words. Same thing, remember P times Q is equal to TR. So average revenue is the same thing as price. That's, that's, that's where it all fits in. This is why you have these two curves, the total revenue curve here and the average revenue curve, which is the demand curve, okay? price and quantity. <clears throat> average cost is total cost divided by quantity. <clears throat> this is also, this is average total cost, I should say, because I don't talk about average fixed cost, average variable, it's a lot of, all of nonsense. This, the average total cost is total cost divided by quantity. In other words, if you spend a, uh, a million dollars and produce 100 units or something, it's the cost is $100,000 per unit. <clears throat> or 10, what is it? $10,000 per unit. In other words, you divide the total cost by the unit. Uh, its average total cost are often full spectacularly for large scale production. Not, not the total, but the average total, the total cost per unit. <clears throat> Okay. All right. This is enough for you to absorb this time. We'll, we'll continue on with this stuff and uh, on Thursday. And I give you back your exams. <laughs> <laughs>